I begin every lecture by saying, okay, so, therefore, I will begin this one a little bit differently, a little change of pace. All right, so uh, presidential power, in this lecture, I'll go over different aspects of the presidency, presidential power, uh, some of the other, you know, ancillary branches and parts of the executive branch, and some of how the president operates in actual American politics, okay? Presidential power has greatly expanded uh, since the time of, say, Washington. Um, as very overstating a little bit, but very generally, uh, 19th century, Congress was the more powerful branch, 20th century, especially after World War II, but really after Woodrow Wilson, the, the presidency becomes the more powerful branch in a lot of ways. Obvious exceptions, um, you know, Abraham Lincoln during the Civil War uh, exercised a lot of important power, but uh, Congress was much more jealous of its prerogatives in the 19th century. Thomas Jefferson, when they look at his, his, his time as president, and one of the reasons that he's considered a fairly successful president is because he was able to influence Congress, even though they, were, they, they did not take kindly to being told what to do at all. So it was in part his subtle, his kind of charming personality and the way he was able to influence them without making it obvious that he was trying to do that or that he was trying to direct Congress as president. Um, different things lead up to it. Woodrow Wilson often considered uh, something of a turning point. Um, and the president begins to dictate, uh, not, not necessarily dictate, but to really kind of set the policy agenda and Congress starts to react to what the president is saying, okay? Uh, different things happen, and we'll talk about this with the imperial president, with the imperial presidency. Different things happen and lead up to that situation, okay, that, that gives the president more, more power uh, in, as a kind of balance of power between the Congress and the president, okay? So presidential power has greatly expanded in part because of that, that change in the balance of power between Congress and the presidency, in part, of course, because the executive branch has grown dramatically since 1787 or since you know 1917. Uh, the executive branch has grown, the country has grown, the government has grown, therefore the president as the, as the ultimate head of the executive branch and therefore the head of that entire federal bureaucracy pretty much, those, those uh, offices are mostly, some of them were created by the constitution, but they are mostly created by Congress and they're regulated by Congress, but who is sort of operating them, uh, who is ultimately Obviously, the president is not reading reports from every uh, one of those uh, departments every day, but at the head of that executive branch, as that executive branch grows larger and larger, the federal bureaucracy, the um, federal government, the, the president is ultimately the head of that as, as the head of the executive branch. So in some ways, then, presidential power has grown because the federal government has grown. And again, in some ways, it's grown in comparison with Congress, okay? The president is now, in many ways, as important as a symbol as he is as the actual uh, executive. That's a bit of an overstatement, but the president is the head of state, okay? The head of government is the, is the person who runs the government on a day-to-day -day basis, the executive. That is, in the United States, that is obviously the president. The head of state is the person who sort of embodies the country or embodies the government as a symbol. And in the United States, that is also the president. In the United Kingdom, the head of government is the prime minister. The head of state is the monarch, okay? So those, those roles are clearly separated and the people who are involved are different people, okay? So during the very beginning of World War II, uh, people, when they sort of rallied around the flag in the United Kingdom as they were uh, attacked by Germany and so on, they, they sort of rallied around the monarchy as that kind of that, that person who embodies and symbolizes the nation as a whole, that was the monarch. The actual prime minister, the person who was making the governmental de decisions, that was first of all Chamberlain and then uh, Churchill. And so the, the, the person running the government was not the, the head of state, not that embodiment or that symbol of the nation, okay? In the United States, both of those, both of those roles, both of those identities are combined in the one person of the president, okay? So you get what people sometimes call the rally round the flag effect. When the United States is threatened or attacked or in danger in some way, People tend to rally around the flag that, that that communal sense becomes stronger and it's often directed towards the president, okay? So you saw that very clearly in the aftermath of the September 11th attacks where George W. Bush, the president, his approval rating shortly after that were like 97%, not because he'd actually done anything yet, but because, you know, it was just saying, what do you think of, of the president? People said, I approve. I think he's great because, again, he has this kind of uh, symbolic uh, identity and power and role as the head of state as well as the head of government, okay? And that gives the president a lot of power. 
uh, and that symbolic, that kind of public profile that the president has, uh, sometimes referred to as the bully pulpit, that, that large stage and profile that the president has to call attention to things and to set the tone for different types of national discussions, that is also very important and powerful, okay? Uh, maybe not he's more important as a symbol, but that is a very important part of what the modern presidency is, okay? Um, so executive branch has expanded, the, the power of the president as the head of state, the, the, the power of the president as a, as, a, as a public figure has grown dramatically in the 20th century because of media, because of the, the relative independence of the president from his party compared to the 19th century because of other things. So the president is far more powerful today in many ways and was throughout most of the 20th and 21st century than what was maybe uh, intended or envisioned uh, by the Constitution and then was the reality for most of the 19th century, okay? That being said, one of the things that the president can do to make things happen are executive orders, okay? An executive order is where the president basically bypasses Congress and signs an executive order that makes something happen without an actual legislative act of Congress, okay? They're obviously, for obvious reasons, they're often very controversial. Uh, because, of course, the president only does that if the president cannot get a, a, the, the, the legislation that he or eventually she wants through Congress, okay? Um, so it can be controversial, but it's a sign of weakness, okay? Unilateral action like that can just be reversed by a new president, as we've seen President Biden, Biden do with a lot of the executive orders that were signed by President Trump. So they get things done in the short term, but actual acts of Congress, actual acts of legislation that go through Congress and become law, those are far more long lasting than executive orders usually are. And your textbook has a chart showing the use of executive orders over the years. They, they were kind of peaked with Franklin Roosevelt, of course, uh, Great Depression, World War II, a lot of reasons why he would have been issuing a lot, but they've become much less common in recent years because again, they are, they are a relatively uh, short term, relative, relatively temporary way to enact policy. If you can get actual acts of Congress passed, that is absolutely what you want as president. Uh, executive orders, again, they irritate the, the, the opponents and they can seem like people are getting what they want in the very short term, but they are short term. They're easily overturned by the next president. Um, and again, acts of Congress were difficult, uh, harder and longer to get through, but definitely much better as a way to actually carry out policy, much more uh, long lasting, okay? And again, they happen, they can be controversial, but in some ways they're a sign of weakness for the president because it means that the president cannot get his policy agenda through Congress, okay? Uh, other aspects of the presidency, the vice presidency, of course, elected with the president, okay? In the vice presidency, there was, I think it was one of Roosevelt's vice presidents who said the vice presidency is not worth a bucket of warm spit. Uh, it's not a pleasant image. Uh, I don't know if warm spit is supposed to be worth more or less than cold spit. But the idea was the vice presidency, it doesn't matter, okay? Nothing happens, you go to funerals, it doesn't matter. However, it, it has always been this way that the uh, vice president can be an important strategic symbol, okay? You talk about balancing the ticket. Sometimes it's geographic. John F. Kennedy from Massachusetts uh, chose Lyndon Johnson as his vice president. Johnson was from Texas. So you kind of had two parts of that democratic coalition at the time, kind of the Northern, somewhat more urban, more obviously liberal uh, part of the coalition. And then you have the, the Southern part of the coalition. You also had Kennedy who was young. He was charismatic. Again, as I think we've talked about, that was, that was new. The idea that the president should be young was, was actually really not what people thought. A lot of people didn't like Kennedy because they thought he was too young to even think about running for president. So Kennedy was young, he was charismatic. He looked very good and spoke very well on television. Johnson was older, had that experience, so they balanced the ticket, okay? Geographically, ideologically, in terms of their different skill sets, in terms of the different things that made them attractive to voters. So strategically, when you're talking about running for president and who you would choose as a vice president, part of what you're doing is trying to balance the ticket, okay? Walter Mondale balanced the ticket for Jimmy Carter. Jimmy Carter, Southern Democrat, Walter Mondale, uh, more of a kind of traditional Northern liberal. Uh, George H.W. Bush, Ronald Reagan's vice president, Reagan was something of an outsider, considered something of a radical, something of a hardliner about communism, um, a little bit dangerous, some people thought. George H.W. Bush was sort of the consummate insider 
Washington uh, Republican. Uh, his father had been a senator. He was, you know, kind of, in, he was a Republican like Reagan, but in many ways, the exact opposite of Reagan. So he balanced the ticket, again, sort of ideologically, sort of in terms of temperament, okay? Uh, so lots of different ways that that can happen. Vice president, very important as a symbol when you're looking at, at who somebody chooses as vice president. Donald Trump chose Mike Pence to, to reach out and really energize those evangelical voters who might have been a little skeptical of Trump, at least at one point, and Pence was popular with them. Joe Biden chooses Kamala Harris, younger African-American female, uh, important parts of the Democratic coalition and ones that maybe Biden would have a little bit of trouble reaching on his own, okay? Uh, in addition to that, the vice president has become an important advisor or can be, okay? Dick Cheney, probably the best example. There was even kind of an ongoing joke that he was actually running the country, that he really was the president, um, making the real decisions for George W. Bush. Al Gore, an important advisor for Bill Clinton. So they can also be important advisors, but the one undisputable thing that they usually do is play an important role in elections and in trying to energize the right parts of the coalition to go out and vote for whoever the presidential nominee is. Okay, the cabinet is the group of uh, advisors. They are subordinate to the president, obviously. They, they are basically the head of the different uh, formal departments, the Department of Defense, the Department of State, the Department of the Interior, and so on. Again, there are far, it's, a, it's a far larger body now than it was in George Washington's time because there are more branches or more uh, departments for obvious reasons. Um, and we have nuclear weapons now, so you create a, a new department of energy to deal with things like that, which are more of a policy concern in the 20th and 21st century than energy was in the 18th century. Okay. As we know, the president appoints people to the cabinet, but they have to, these appointments have to be approved by the Senate. In addition to the cabinet, there's something called the executive office, and this is things like the National Security Council, the Council of Economic Advisors, the Office of Management and Budget. These are people, the cabinet, they are often uh, political figures in their own right. Okay, they are often, you know, Barack Obama, his Secretary of State was Hillary Clinton, who had been a senator, who obviously eventually ran for president herself. She had, she was a political actor, she had political ambitions. Uh, oftentimes members of the cabinet, they may not have ambitions beyond the cabinet, but they usually are politicians. They usually have some sort of background in politics, okay? The executive office, on the other hand, these are advisors and their real background is in policy itself, okay? So they tend to be experts in national security or, or economics or uh, budgeting and things like that, okay? So these are another group of advisors that the president has who report directly to the president. And again, their background and their concern tends to be much more simply with policy for its own sake. They are not, they are not politicians and public figures the way that members of the cabinet usually are. Okay, White House staff used to be quite small. Jefferson had only one messenger and one secretary, okay? Uh, Woodrow Wilson typed his own letters. That's probably my favorite story or example. Uh, when uh, Franklin Roosevelt said that Herbert Hoover, his uh, his predecessor, who had been president for the first few years of the Great Depression and had done very little about it. Uh, Roosevelt used to say that Hoover's greatest achievement as president was convincing Congress to give him a second secretary, um, which is quite possibly fair and accurate. However, also tells you how small the White House staff was. Also tells you something, again, about the relationship and, and the balance of power between Congress and the presidency. The notion that then in the 1920s, early 1930s, the president would have to sort of ask Congress for authorization and, and a, you know, allocation in the budget for a second secretary says something, you know, says a lot about that, that relationship between president, between the president and Congress. Uh, and again, also tells you how small it used to be. Obviously today it's much larger. Um, there's the chief of staff, a very important person who kind of controls access to the president in many ways. Um, and then there's a the whole, you know, press secretaries, congressional liaisons, people who go and talk to Congress on behalf of the president, all sorts of people. Good staff members are self-effacing and loyal. They are primarily focused, again, not on advancing their careers beyond the White House, not on becoming well-known, but on serving the president effectively. So they tend to be self-effacing. They are not looking for publicity and very loyal, okay? And that's really what you're looking for in the White House staff, as opposed to, again, some of those other political allies and political appointments that the president may make to things like the cabinet, okay? The first lady, obviously the president's spouse, uh, the president's wife. Um, the, the first lady, 
if you go back far enough, was not really expected to have much of a public role, maybe entertained at the White House. But in terms of, pub, of publicity and public, uh, the kind of public aspect of the presidency, um, the first lady has come to be an advocate. Usually the first lady will, her, her public role, among other things, again, she will still be a host and so on, but usually the first lady will pick a single extremely uncontroversial issue and become an advocate for that, okay? Lady Bird Johnson was one of the first to sort of pioneer this approach to the, to that, to, to the first lady. It's not, it's not an official office, but, but to that role, she focused on beautification, plant flowers, make, make the country uh, more beautiful and so on. Nancy Reagan, just say no to drugs. Uh, Laura Bush, read to children. Uh, Michelle Obama, you know, better nutrition. These are things that they tend to kind of consistently advocate. And usually they are very uncontroversial. Nobody, uh, even a partisan enemy of the president could really find fault with it, although people managed to get upset about Michelle Obama telling people to, you know, eat more, more, more nutritious foods and so on. But generally, that's the approach of the uh, first lady and kind of the role that has kind of developed for her. Not everybody does it. Hillary Clinton did not really do that. She was somewhat more controversial because of it, okay? Presidential leadership of Congress. Again, we know separate uh, branches separate institutions, separation of power, checks and balances. The president cannot directly introduce legislation. The president cannot directly do anything with Congress. Okay, but the president can informally propose legislation, uh, use his influence with his party and especially his strongest allies in Congress to promote it. In terms of negotiating with Congress, okay, the president has the veto. So, so in terms of, you know, uh, leadership of Congress, there's maybe not leadership, the president can veto something that he really does not want to sign into law. But of course, there's also the threat of the veto. So the president can help to shape legislation by telling Congress, if you pass this law with this particular provision, I will veto it. If you remove that provision, or if you add this provision that I want you to have, I will not veto this, it will become law. However, if you do not do this, then I will veto it. So that can be a, a process of negotiation. And in that way, the president, again, without actually being a member of Congress, without actually being directly there and, and part of that body, the president can influence it through that negotiation involving the veto and so on. Okay, the president and his party, the president obviously has great influence over the party, but that is limited. We talked about this when we talked about Congress and how uh, party leaders in Congress are relatively weak. Um, the president is relatively weak compared to other, other countries. In the United Kingdom, the prime minister, the, the, the executive, the head of government, is also a member of the, of the, of the parliament itself. So the president is, or the, the prime minister is actually a member of parliament, a member of that party that has the majority in parliament. When, that, when it's expected, it doesn't happen 100% of the time, but it's generally expected that the party will vote with the prime minister. And if they don't, they could lose a vote of no confidence. There are all kinds of reasons. Now, again, that doesn't always happen. Sometimes people, especially they're, they're usually called backbenchers, kind of younger, uh, less important. Maybe they are ideologically out of step with the prime minister and the, and the, the leadership of the party, or maybe they just haven't, they haven't gotten into a position of real power yet. They may vote against the party on some things. But in the uh, case of the United States, since the president is not the formal head of, of his party and is not a member of Congress and has no direct control over these members of Congress, uh, the president's influence over even his own party in Congress is relatively weak. Because again, those members of Congress have to be reelected, not by the president, but by their own voters back in their home district or back in their home state. So there have been many cases where the president really wanted to get an important piece of legislation through, through Congress, and it failed because members of his own party voted, did not vote the way the president wanted. Bill Clinton had a very, very ambitious uh, health care reform bill that he really, you know, again, he introduced it. Obviously, he's not a member of Congress, but he had uh, allies of his introduce it. It became controversial. It failed to pass Congress because members of his own party did not vote for it. They voted against it because it had become it had become so unpopular. Same thing happened with George W. Bush and immigration reform. Same thing happened with Donald Trump and his attempts to repeal Obamacare or the Affordable Care Act, okay? So the president is not the head of the party organization. The president cannot you know, refuse to uh, provide funding or uh, the kind of official party logistical support for a, for a member of Congress who does not vote with the president. 
So the influence that the president may have, I mean, obviously the president is the most visible uh, member of the, of the party, but that influence is, is informal and is relatively weak, okay? And people who defy the president on important votes in Congress, members of the president's own party who defy the president on important votes, usually they don't always get reelected because they may have lost support among their voters anyways. But they, they, you know, they, they do not need to worry about the president nearly as much as they need to worry about their own voters, okay? Along with that, the president can be an asset to his party in elections if he's very popular, or can be a liability if he's very unpopular. You can see both with President George W. Bush helped his party greatly, in, especially in 2002, also 2004, but by 2006, when the Democrats won a majority in the uh, Congress, and 2008, when he was, you know, basically every, every Republican wanted to pretend like they had never heard of George W. Bush, he was a huge liability. So as that very visible member and almost the face of the party, the president can be, can really help the party or can be a real weakness. Okay, a lot of that obviously comes down to public approval, which people have tracked very closely with the president over the past few uh, decades. Head of state and head of, and head of government, we've already talked about that. Uh, themes and self-reinforcing character, okay, oftentimes, of course, there is a theme emerges in immediate, in immediate coverage about a president and it becomes kind of how they are known and then things that reinforce that feed into it further, okay? So sometimes these themes develop and people come to be seen in a particular way and that, that reinforcement just continues, okay? Legislative skills, those are the skills of the president in dealing with Congress. It can be persuading, okay, actually reasoning with them, persuading them, but also bargaining, okay, just flat out telling them we will add these things to the bill if you will vote in favor of it. This is often not a very edifying uh, spectacle or a very edifying process of our, dem or a very uh, edifying part or of our democratic process, but it's there, it's clear, uh, there's a quotation there in the PowerPoints from David Stockman, who was Reagan's budget director, about how, how did they get his signature 1981 tax cut? How did they get that through? Uh, largely through just telling people, you know, th those last 10 or 20% of the votes, uh, it came down to just convincing people, listen, if you do this, we will give you this, this extra thing, okay? We will add to this bill support or funding for your district or your state, okay? In terms of the president and the ambitions they may have and what they want to do as president, there is what is often known as the honeymoon period. Early in their, um, early in their um, presidency, the idea is that Congress, the media, maybe they're giving them a bit of a honeymoon. They're kind of not being super aggressive or super adversarial yet. They're letting them see what they do. So that's the time for the president to come in and really try to be effective and really try to make dramatic uh, legislative achievements, okay? Franklin Roosevelt probably did the absolute best with that. His first 100 days, he basically revolutionized government in many ways. Um, and he kind of started, that's when people started looking at the first 100 days. Subsequent presidents have often felt like, don't compare me to Franklin Roosevelt. In the first 100 days, I can't possibly do all of that. But that honeymoon period, different examples, Ronald Reagan, had a clear thing he wanted to do, those tax cuts. They were difficult, they were ambitious, they were hard to get through Congress, but that's what he focused on. He used all of his political capital there to get that through. It was successful. He became known, associated with those tax cuts. The economy eventually picked up. The economy was relatively weak when he was elected, picked up much better by the time he was ran for re-election in 1984. When he did, he literally said, ask yourselves, are you better off today than you were 40 years ago? Some of that was intangible, the, the general sense of uh, optimism in the country and so on, but a lot of it he was just talking about economically. So those tax cuts that he had gotten through became associated with him and became associated with that economic upturn, okay? So it was ambitious, he used it well, and he had a clear vision. It was something ambitious, he got it through and he was rewarded um, in the public mind and then ultimately by being reelected. His successor, George H.W. Bush, the first George Bush, he did not, as he himself put it, he didn't have the vision thing. He didn't have a, I mean, in retrospect, he was a very effective president, especially in questions of foreign policy, right? He was president, Soviet Union was collapsing, uh, the entire world order was being changed in very fundamental ways. He was able to manage all of that very effectively, but he was not good at having a clear sense of, this is, this is the goal that I have. This is what I want things to look like. And he certainly wasn't good at conveying that to people. So 
his honeymoon period, he again, it's not really fair to say he didn't do anything because he was overseeing the dismantling of the uh, Eastern Bloc and the Soviet Union and all of that. But he didn't necessarily do anything domestically that people associated with him, uh, that people associated with him. So when he ran for re-election, there, there was a recession, which hurt him greatly. But it was also people were sort of like, what is, this, what is this guy about? Why is he president? What is he doing? OK, so his lack of exploitation of the honeymoon period sort of hurt him. Then Bill Clinton, his successor, came in with, as we mentioned, a very ambitious uh, health care reform. And it, it did not get through Congress. OK, public opinion turned against it. It, the Democrats had a majority in Congress, but many of them voted against, uh, I mean, not many, but enough that it didn't pass, voted against his health care plan. Uh, the Democrats then lost control of Congress. They, they lost their congressional majority in that midterm election in 1994. And he spent most of the rest of his first term uh, kind of playing defense, kind of on his back foot, being defensive, kind of trying to react to the failure of that. He was still reelected in part because the 90s, you know, massive uh, economic boom, great economic prosperity, uh, the peace dividend, as they put it, the Cold War was over. There was, it was a very good, it was a very good time uh, to be president. Uh, it was a lot of good things, a lot of happy things in the country to be associated with as president. Uh, so he was still reelected, but it in many ways probably hurt his ability to govern and to do as much as he may have because he had ambition for that honeymoon period. He had ambition for the beginning of his term and he just was not able to, to carry it through, okay? So those are kind of three different approaches to that honeymoon period. Ambitious, successful, rewarded, no real ambition, no clear sense of what he might want to do and, and what he might want to be known for as president uh, and, you know, uh, suffered for it. Ambitious, failed, still reelected, but again, kind of a unique situation in some ways. Uh, Bill Clinton, the 1990s. Um, Studies, when political scientists study it, when they, when they look at it, they say presidents who have great legislative skills, like Lyndon Johnson, again, Johnson, long career in the Senate, got the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, got those both passed by a, by a very resistant Congress. Okay, he had great legislative skills, but they're not necessarily more successful in dealing with Congress than those without them. Jimmy Carter had terrible legislative skills. He was not a member of the... He, was a governor of Georgia, had not spent much time in Washington, uh, did not really understand Congress, did not understand the personalities. A lot of people found him sanctimonious and alienating. So he did not have good legislative skills. But Lyndon Johnson, once he was associated with the Vietnam War and considered effectively a lamed up president and something of a, of a failure as a president, someone who would not be reelected, he was no more influential with Congress than uh, Jimmy Carter was, okay? So even though we know that he had the ability, he had great legislative skills, that by itself is not enough to uh, actually get things through, through Congress, actually for the president to actually be able to lead Congress the way that some people may want the president to, okay? President and national security, we'll talk about this more when we talk about the imperial presidency. The president is the commander in chief, as we've talked about with the Federalist Papers, okay? What that means, relatively limited compared to what people sometimes thought that it means, means that the president is ultimately in charge of the military. Um, when it's in use, can make personnel decisions like, like Abraham Lincoln did during the Civil War. Um, president is the chief diplomat, okay? Many of the treaties that the United States has, of course, are negotiated and written out and all kinds of things by relatively low level, not low level, but by, you know, uh, career diplomats in the Department of State, not by the president himself. But on really important things, the president is the chief diplomat. The president negotiates important uh, agreements with other countries, okay? So that is one of the, again, it's an informal role. It's not really laid out in the constitution, but the president is the chief diplomat, whether it's dealing with, you know, when you're dealing with heads of uh, other countries, okay? The president is also a crisis manager, okay? The Cuban Missile Crisis is a great um, 20th century, maybe not quite contemporary for most people now, but relatively recent example. But again, in terms of national security, one of the reasons you have a president is to deal with crises. Cuban Missile Crisis, a great example, not enough time for Congress to act, probably not a great situation for Congress to try to act, but the president was able to handle it and handle it very well, okay? On more long-term things, the president has to work with Congress. Congress has the appropriations power. The Congress decides what money is going to be spent, how much, and for what. 
um, and they can just refuse to, to fund something. If the president starts a war, if the president does something that, that uh, is unconstitutional or that the Congress does not think is a good idea, Congress can always stop it by refusing to fund it. However, in practice, Congress is usually very weak when they're trying to challenge the president on things like that. Uh, it's actually politically advantageous, at least in the 20th and 21st century, for Congress to kind of let the president do certain things in foreign policy because voters tend to punish the president when they go wrong, not Congress, okay? The Iraq war, something of an, of an, of an exception, okay? Um, again, many Republicans lost uh, in 2006 and 2008 in part because they were associated with George W. Bush and the Iraq war. Uh, obviously it hurt Democrats like uh, John Kerry or Hillary Clinton who ran for president had to explain why they voted to authorize the use of force in Iraq. Um, but generally speaking, Congress has become somewhat weak compared to the president when it comes to questions of, of you know, uh, they don't want to seem soft on communism or more recently soft on terrorism. So although Congress constitutionally has a lot of important powers and can stop the president, check, check the president before anything happens, and then can, if the president does do something, can end it by refusing to pay for it, in terms of politics and public opinion, Congress is relatively weak and therefore usually goes along with the president in the hopes that if things do go wrong, the, the public, the voters will, will blame the president, not Congress. So although the constitutional means are there to stop these things, that is not always what happens in practice.